blind in one eye and can't see out of the other sometimes. So We're in John chapter 2, verses 13 to 25 today. I want to ask you the question. You don't have to tell me instances. Have you ever been angry? <laughs> have you ever been angry? What makes you angry? This scripture is the first recording of the first Passover feast of the Jews. It's obvious, not the first one that Jesus had ever been to. As a Jewish male, he would have, and, and his family being Jewish, he would have went to every Passover feast, feast that was out there. When he was 12, he was uh, at the Passover feast, and we talked about that a couple of weeks ago. He was at a Passover feast when they started heading home, the feast for a week long, and the family started heading home, and all of a sudden, a day out, they realized they didn't have Jesus. They didn't have him with them. And so they go back, it took them three days to find him in the temple. So, and he was there reasoning with the, with the teachers and the Pharisees and the scribes, and they were amazed at his knowledge and understanding at 12 years old. So now, at this feast, in uh, chapter 2, verse, uh, starting with verse 13, He's approximately 30 years old, and uh, he's beginning his public ministry. We saw last week that he was starting to call his disciples. And his disciples first called were Andrew, Peter, Philip, and Nathaniel. These disciples would become the foundation of the early church, of the 12 apostles, and they would become the foundation of the church, and the church is still being built Every person who comes to faith in Christ is part of that church. And Peter identifies him as the Christ as the Son of God in Matthew 16 and 18, 16, 18 and following. Jesus told him that, that this uh, witness would be the rock on which he would build his church. And it's still being built today, as I said before. John has spent the last entire first chapter, John the Baptist, John the Apostle, building a case for Jesus being Lord, the creator of the universe. So he, spilt the, he, he spent the first chapter doing that, all, all these verses that is a witness. Even in chapter 2, turning water into wine, was a witness of who Jesus really is. He set aside the laws of nature. I don't know how long it takes to make wine because I've never made it, but it takes more than five minutes. And so he was able to convert water into wine, setting aside the laws of nature. But there's a more important message in that. Of course, we talked about last week, the message is that Jesus is the very best that God had to offer. Anything else up to that point, anything else before him was second best. But always pointing forward, to the best. Jesus was the very best wine. So in John uh, chapter 2, verses 13 to 25, I've entitled this, Have You Ever Been Angry? And Jesus, I think, got angry more than just these two times mentioned in the Bible. These two times were times that he got violently angry. In other words, he took matters into his own hands. But I know he got angry other times as well. In John, or in Luke 13, 10 to 13, we see he was teaching in a synagogue and he saw a woman there who had been bent over for 18 years. Now, we've all seen older people walk bent over like this. She was bent over like that. She was really bent over. But the reason why she was bent over, she was under oppression by Satan. She was in bondage. And he looked at her and he said, Woman, you are freed from your sickness. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made erect. You can imagine going from this, all of a sudden being able to do this after 18 years. It's amazing. Amazing miracle that he did. And she began glorifying God, as any of us would. We'd be jumping up and down and, and dancing around and praising God. But the synagogue official was indignant 
that Jesus had healed on the Sabbath. Can you imagine that? And he said to the crowd, there are six days a week in which to work, which work should be done. So come during them and get healed, not on the Sabbath day. And you can hear probably, the Bible doesn't say it, but you could probably hear murmurings of assent from some of the people in a con- in a synagogue. Oh, well, yeah, that's right, that's right. Jesus was incensed almost. He said, you hypocrites, which one of you would not untie his donkey from the stall and lead him away to water him? This woman, who is a daughter of Abraham, as she is, whom Satan has bound for 18 long years, should she not have been released on the, from this bond on the Sabbath day. As he said this, his opponents were being humiliated. But the entire crowd was rejoicing over the glorious things being done by him. Another instance, when Jesus was, was angry, there was a man who had a withered hand. He was in the synagogue again, and there was a man there who was uh, in a synagogue on the Sabbath. And Jesus saw him. It's thought by scholars that this man had been planted there by the Pharisees to trap Jesus. He probably was an unwilling, didn't know that he was a plant. But they made sure he was there at the synagogue. He had a withered head. If you've ever seen anybody with a withered hand, it's all shriveled up. And it's useless to them. They kind of walk with a shriveled up hand. And they can't do much with it. And so he was there with a withered hand, and Jesus saw him. And he he also saw the heart of those who were trying to trap him. In Matthew 3, or Mark 3, verses 1 to 6, Again he entered the synagogue, and a man with a withered hand was there. And they watched Jesus to see whether or not he would heal him on a Sabbath, so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man with a withered hand, Come here. And he said to them, Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save a life or to kill? But they were silent. And he looked around them, around him with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart. He said, Stretch out your hand, and the hand was restored immediately. The Pharisees went out and immediately took counsel with the Herodians against him how to destroy him. Here we see the difference between religion and relationship, don't we? Religion has rules. You must follow the rules. There's rules in Christianity. They're called the Ten Commandments. There are rules. Do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness. There are lots of, lots of rules, but Jesus is looking for a relationship with him. People, the Pharisees were good at keeping rules. Not so good at relationship with Jesus. So we're now at the Passover, Passover feast of the Jews, and Jesus went into Jerusalem. Since Jerusalem was higher, actually Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Since Jerusalem is higher than the surrounding area all around it, no matter which direction you came from, you're always going up to Jerusalem because the elevation is higher. So they went up to Jerusalem, and he used that very fact that Jerusalem is higher than other than the surrounding areas. In his Sermon on the Mount, he said, a city on a hill cannot be hidden. Well, it doesn't necessarily have to be on a hill. If you drive down into Duluth, off the hill on, on I-35, and you come, uh, you come down, the whole city is spread out before you. It's beautiful at night. City on a hill cannot be hidden. But that was in reference to Christians, to us as believers in Christ, that we should not hide our light under a bushel. We know the Sunday school song, hide it under a bushel, no. He said, don't, let your, don't hide your light under a bushel, but put it on a stand for all to see. I know, I've, I've known several people down through the years where they didn't want anybody to know they were Christians. Why? because they didn't want the ridicule that they would receive if other people knew they were Christians. So as Jesus went up to Jerusalem, it's what he found in the temple that infuriated him. Like I say, this is one or two times it mentions in the Gospels that he was violently angry. 
Verse 14. And he found in the temple those who were selling oxen, sheep, and doves, and money changers seated at the tables. Now you can imagine the commotion that's going on here. You know, if you have animals or you have had animals in the past, you know how much mooing and bellering and bleeding and the, the doves are pacing back and forth in their cages and cooing. There's clanging of money in the, in the, on the scales as they're exchanging the Roman coins for the temple money so that they could make an offering in the temple. There's all this stuff going on in the temple. So, and it all seems quite innocuous. So, well, it's necessary temple business. You know, they had to exchange, if they had a, a, a sheep or a goat that was an unacceptable sacrifice, they had to purchase another one. Or if they came without a sacrifice, they, they would just, well, it's just easier to buy one there, and then they would buy a sacrifice. Or the, and all this stuff is going on in the temple, and Jesus looked around and saw all this. And it seemed like it was necessary temple business, but not to Jesus. All this business was being done in the court of the Gentiles. This was the only place, and we're all Gentiles. I don't think any of us here is Jewish, at least not fully full-blood Jew. They couldn't go into the court of the Jews. They had to stay out in the court of the Gentiles, but all this commerce, all this commotion is going on there, and this was where they were supposed to pray. Can you imagine trying to pray if all kinds of commotion is going on here in church. It's pretty hard. So anyway, that's, if, they would, if a Gentile went into the court of the, Gentile, uh, court of the Jews, they would be immediately taken out and stoned because they would have defiled the temple. And that is exactly what they thought happened in Acts 21, verses 27 through 29. Paul yeah. Is mentioned here, he said, when seven days are almost over, the Jews from Asia, upon seeing him in the temple, began to stir up the, all the crowd and laid hands on him, now referring to Paul, crying out, Man of Israel, come to our aid. This is the man who preaches to all men everywhere against our people in the law and the place and this place, and besides, it's even brought a Greek into the temple and has defiled the holy place. For they had seen previously Trophimus, an Ephesian, in the city, and they had seen him with Paul, and they presumed that he had brought him into the temple, defiled, defiled the temple. And Paul would have not have survived the ensuing riot. They, they started a huge riot, and Paul would have not have survived it if the Roman soldiers had not intervened and saved his life. But that is how important it was that this court, this court of the Gentiles, be open so that people could come and pray. It proved that the Jewish religious leaders had very little concern or regard for anything but their commerce that was going on there, for conducting business. Where Jesus was concerned that his house will be a house of prayer. This house shall be a house of prayer. Not a house of commerce. So verses 15 to 16, we read, And he made a scourge of cords and drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen and poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And to those who were selling doves, he said, Take these things away and stop making my father's house a house of business. So you can imagine the commotion he's just creating. He's, he's got this scourge, scourge of cords that he's made, and he's driving out all the animals, and they're bellering, and the sheep are bleeding, and the, and the coins are being scattered all over the floor, and the tables are being overturned. And then all of a sudden, a stunned silence. And they could hear Jesus screaming out, take these things away and stop making my father's house a house of business. Well, the Jews wanted to know by what authority he was doing these things. One day Jesus will come back. He will come back with fire coming from his eye. He will come back on a white horse. 
He will come back with a sword protruding out of his mouth, the word of God. He will come back with a name written on his thigh, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and he will come as a conquering king. Jesus came into the temple on a donkey. That meant he'd come in peace. The next time he comes, he will come on a white horse, and he will come as a conquering king, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. There will be no question of his authority at that time. But on this day there was. They wanted to know by what authority he was doing these things. Verse 18, the Jews said to him, What sign do you show us as to your authority for doing all these things? In other words, they're saying, How dare you upset the apple cart here? How dare you kick all these people out of here? How dare you overturn and make all this commotion? Overturn the money changers. How, who gave you the authority to do this? Well, we've been reading in chapter 1 the authority that Jesus had, creator of the universe. Creator of the universe, the world, and everything in it. He is God in the flesh. And so his answer was kind of mysterious. He said, destroy this temple and three days I will build it up again. And he wasn't speaking of the physical temple building that they were standing in at the time, but that's what they thought. You could see the look of incredulous look on their face. Destroy this temple in three days and you build it up. It took 46 years to build this temple. It was part of Herod's uh, remodeling project. It took him 46 years to remodel the temple. And it was a really... Uh, uh, one, of the seven, one of the big wonders of the world, the Jewish temple. But he was referring to the temple of his body. Destroy this temple, not the physical temple. Destroy this temple in three days. I will raise it up. And his disciples remembered. They remembered that he had said this after he was raised from the dead, and they believed the scripture and the words he had spoken. Verse 23. Now, while he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, during the feast, many believed in his name, observing the signs which he was doing. Jesus told Philip in John 14, 8 to 11. Philip had asked him a question, and Philip was serious. He's, he said, Lord, show us the Father, and it's enough for us. Well, Jesus told him, he said, have I been with you so long, and yet you do not know me? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say, I do not say on my own initiative, but as the Father abiding in me does his works, believe in me. Otherwise, believe in me because of the works themselves. The works pointed to the fact that he was, he was God in the flesh. The miracles that he performed Raising people from the dead, casting out demons, uh, healing the sick. All these things that he did proved that he was God in the flesh. Nicodemus almost got it in John chapter 3, and we'll look at this more next week. But in John chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, he came to Jesus at night. So Nicodemus was a man of the Pharisees a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have been sent from God as a teacher, for no one can do the works that you do unless God is with him. He almost got it. I mean, he was right there. No one can do the works that you do unless God is with him. But Jesus tells him he must be born again. You know how it is. If you're not born again, you can't understand, fully understand who Jesus is. You cannot see the kingdom of God. And, and you know how it is? You explain to people about the gospel. You tell people about Jesus and what he can do for them. And sometimes it just goes right over the top of them. They just don't get it. Because they're not born again. When they become born again, the lights come on and they, they see a relationship verse before they only saw rules. Jesus tells Nicodemus he must be born again. 
We know this chorus. We've sung it here many times. We haven't sung it recently. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. Hope that's your prayer today. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. And that's what Jesus meant when he told Nicodemus, he must be born again. He must be born again in order to understand who Jesus really was. What John wants us to know in the scriptures, Jesus is Lord. Creator of the universe, the Lamb of God who takes away yours and my sin, sin of the world. The testimony they give is rock solid. Who hold up in a court of law. Matter of fact, if you remember the book Case for Christ by Lee Strobel, he set out to prove that Christianity was false. His wife came to faith in the Lord, and he set out to prove that she was wrong. And he ended up becoming a believer because the evidence he looked at showed that it was the Bible was true. So many people have done that. They've tried to disprove the Bible and come away believing. Because it stands up under scrutiny, it'll stand up in a court of law. This testimony is sufficient. A sufficient testimony to prove the case of who Jesus is. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God, is what Peter said. Who do people say that I am? Who do you say that I am? This should be our testimony to the watching world around us as well. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Father, we thank you for the testimony these men have provided for us. That we can point to this and say, yes, this is true because we have the testimony of those who were there, who saw it, who heard his words and recorded it for us. And so we thank you now, Lord, for what you've revealed and continue to reveal to us in these scriptures, that Jesus is Lord, Lord of all. Thank you, Lord, in your name. Amen.